Hey, it's nice to see everybody. Uh, my name's Carissa, and I'm from Oakland, California. It's not as sunny as you think. Um, and you can find me on Twitter, OK Distribute. So I'm gonna, today I'm going to talk about the web of commons. So let's play a game. If you guys ready to play a game? I know it's 9.30 in the morning, but we got to like get ready. So two people are accused of a crime. Neither of them did it, of course. But just in case, they have a pact that they'll never confess. But a cop comes in and separates them with the goal to try and get a confession out of them. So you can actually map this game into outcomes. If one of them defects and confesses, they will get out of jail free, and the other will serve 20 years. If they both defect, and oops, we both uh, tried to get over on each other, they get five years. And if they both stay silent, they get one year. So the ideal scenario that optimizes for the lowest amount of jail time is for both of them to keep their pact, right? To have cooperation with each other. However, because defection results in a better payoff, it's actually more likely to happen than cooperating. It's a dominant strategy. So the dilemma, the prisoner's dilemma, then is that mutual cooperation is better, but less likely to happen. So this is an economic theory that is applied to a lot of environmental phenomenon. For example, climate change or overfishing, right? So people take more than they give and they don't cooperate. So the common pool recess, resource depletes over time. The proposed solution, which has been the proposed solution since probably the 18th century, is called enclosure, literally creating fences around the land and giving property ownership to certain people. And they, it was thought that this was the only way to protect places. It was thought that only that isolated autonomous individuals will always choose the path that's best for themselves to get out of jail quickly. So in 1968, Garrett Hardin, who is the famous person who came up with this tragedy of the commons, said, freedom in a commons brings ruin to all. And this was the prevailing theory for a long time. Until 2009, when Eleanor Ostrom was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics, she, for over 40 years, she studied this concept and proved that Hardin exaggerated the problems involved in managing a commons. She asked the question, what if we aren't isolated autonomous individuals? What if we have the ability to mutually cooperate? She came up with rules and norms that people use to sustain their mutual cooperation over time. And she did this by studying real people in real places. So for example, this is her in Nepal in 1993, um, where she studied irrigation management systems. And she did this all over the place. She did this in Guatemala, Turkey, Kenya. She even went to Los Angeles and Chicago and looked at policing as a commons and saw how cops might be able to mutually cooperate. So instead of thinking about people as rational actors, we're actually thinking of people as irrational managers together. So what does that have to do with the internet? In 2011, she published a book with Charlotte Hess called Understanding Knowledge as a Commons. So what is knowledge, right? So in the digital world, we're talking about libraries, online classes, open source, wikis. We have this. Um, the digital artifacts that we see online can be managed as a commons. They are all used by and benefit a wide community largely for free and it costs close to nothing to share, remix, and copy their contents. However, they can be polluted, for example, by actors that aren't uh, doing right by the community. So looking at knowledge as a commons, as a shared resource, if we're looking at it as what it actually is, it allows us to really understand its possibilities and also what threatens it. So what threatens digital knowledge today? So if we think about managing these commons as a blueprint, there's like a blueprint for managing them. 
and the resources knowledge, we're actually more likely to see many communities managing themselves rather than one monolithic community that manages the whole web or something like that. So um, today what I'm going to talk about is our work on these particular areas, public data, scientific articles, scientific data and libraries, and how we can apply commons theory to these kinds of things um, along with decentralized technology. So I work with uh, Code for Science and Society. I co-founded this nonprofit. Um, we're funded by the Knight and the Sloan Foundation. I founded it with this guy, Max Ogden, and this guy, Matthias Bus. Um, and we, help, we make tools that help scientists share data. That's our primary concern, although you're developers and you might find the tools underneath to be very, very interesting for things that you're doing. So most recently, we've been talking about scientific, scientific data as a commons. And it's a really good use case for commons. So let me give an example of what's actually happening today. Um, who's familiar with Elsevier and JSTOR? Are you guys familiar? OK, not super many of you. These are journals um, sort of publishing companies. There's a lot of them. But basically, they take public information, information that was public, um, either funded by the public or otherwise generated by researchers and labs, and they literally build walled gardens around them. There's paywalls. Um, they literally build fences. It's like what we were talking about earlier with enclosure. They're literally doing the same thing. They're building a fence around the digital knowledge that you have to pay money to get access to. Um, this means that certain people with power can profit from it, and it reduces everyone's ability to use it. Um, and it prevents innovation, and it prevents the spread of knowledge. So this is a bad thing. We don't like this. Um, in the web of commons, in a different kind of world, you might see that users are in control and would be trusted to self-govern and manage this data together, rather than giving it all to one company. And so I want to return to Eleanor Ostrom and see how we can use the eight principles of common pool resource management that she created, this sort of algorithm for creating commons, and how we can apply that to scientific articles and data. So one of the first rules is you need to define clear community and resource boundaries. So in this case, the community is researchers, librarians, universities, and labs. And the resource that we're looking at is scientific data and code. We're really focusing here on data because it's um, really large and really difficult to store, and nobody really wants to touch it. Um, it's a really expensive thing to manage, so we've been really tasked with this in particular. Um, and you want to match the usage rules to local needs and conditions. So that means we've been working with real users, so we've been working with the University of California, Berkeley, um, along with other places, um, to try and make sure that this is all working together. So one of the biggest problems they have is they have a server, and this, everybody comes to the server to try and get the data. And if you only have one server for hundreds of terabytes of data, bad things happen, right? Um, so what we're trying to do is get away from these centralized and enclosed services. We don't want to recreate the problem that is existing now. We want to have something that's decentralized. So we want to have something. Um, that doesn't have this 404 problem. I don't know if you understand the 404 problem, but basically most of scientific research has a problem where it cannot um, link back to the data that it was using. Um, and a lot of this is because of HTTP, literally. If the server changes or you lose access to your Google Drive or something, then the links all entirely break if a grad student moves on or something like that. So we're really interested in using a decentralized service that has content addressability where the link doesn't change over time. But wait a second. Don't they have a good reason for enclosure? Like, don't, don't, wait, don't we want to, like, have good control over copyright? Like, why are we trying to decentralize and give away everything away for free? So copyright. In this case, at least, it means that the public pays twice. So the public is funding the research, and then they have to pay again to get access to it. It doesn't really make sense, especially if we're able to reduce the cost of distribution to zero, which I'm going to try and do. 
Another rationale given is that it's really expensive. So um, it's really expensive to host all this data and give it away, which is really true. I mean, it is expensive to manage and maintain databases and these kinds of things. Um, but we try to reduce that cost as low as possible by using a distributed network, kind of similar to BitTorrent. So as more people come and download the articles and data, and the more people that have it, the faster and cheaper it gets, rather than the more expensive and slower. So the great thing about BitTorrent and compared to centralized services is that it's distributed, like I just said. It's also massively adopted and simple, so you can build a client on top of BitTorrent. Um, there are future-proof links, so if I link to something in BitTorrent, it's probably never, the link will never change, even if it changes servers. The problem is, is it scales really poorly. Um, files cannot be updated, and it's not really secure, so I can look and see everything that you're downloading all the time. Um, Sci-Hub has been, um, and other kinds of places, have been using tools like BitTorrent, and there's been a lot of um, debate about whether this is ethical or not to use uh, a peer-to-peer -peer or other kind of technology to get around copyright. But the dream is, and this is the dream that we're trying to do in practice um, and legally with the cooperation of universities. Um, we're working with the University of California um, and we want to turn their previously siloed servers. I mean, right now, every university has a big server farm that isn't used. Like, it's like 50% used, or like maybe even like, you know, there's only like 10 gigabytes on their 400 terabyte drives. So, um, there's a lot of unused space. Um, so, what happens if we connect these siloed servers? and we build them into a distributed network, a commons, where they share their resources, um, and you look at storage and bandwidth as a resource that should be shared and um, mutually cooperated as a commons rather than a competitive commodity like it is today. So going back to Ostrom, we want to make sure that those affected by the rules can participate in modifying the rules. So digital libraries will handle the power structures here, so we're working with the California Digital Library. We want to make sure that rulemaking rights of community members are respected by outside authorities. So in this case, outside authorities are governments and corporations. We want to make sure that the universities are autonomous and are able to um, manage their own data without interference. One of the things that's happened in Turkey recently is that there's been people who um, haven't been able to say what they want to say in universities and they get uh, censored or even kicked out of their jobs for criticizing the government. And it's even happening in the United States um, and other places around the world. So we want to make sure that governments and corporations don't really have an ability to affect science. Science should be separate from these. Um, so what we want to do is the main rule that we're trying to optimize for when we're talking about rulemaking rights is how do we have rules that keep the data online? So one of the biggest problems with BitTorrent, I know none of you have used BitTorrent before, of course, but <laughs> one of the biggest problems with BitTorrent is when there aren't any peers online, right? You see this awesome thing that you want to download and it's not there. And this is um, something that we really need to prevent from happening in this case, because um, if there aren't any stable and trusted peers in the case of scientific data, it's equivalent to a forest fire. It's completely disastrous, and it's not, it's not something we want. So we want to develop a system carried about by community members for monitoring, whoop, for monitoring members' behavior. So what do I mean by behavior? What do we monitoring members' behavior? Like, we want to see who is doing their part to back up data. And if um, uh, one of the universities or some other partner who's downloading data um, can't keep that data online, then we need to be able to monitor that over time. Um, for example, we can detect how many copies are available in different places, just like BitTorrent, and compute the health of it. Um, for example, if we have data hosted at the Internet Archive, uh, the University of Pennsylvania and UC Berkeley, it's probably really healthy and has a low probability of ever going offline. 
Um, these groups would also be considered members of a community that governs it. And this is a lot more safe than, say, having like 100 laptops, right? So you, by, able to, like, by being able to see who's hosting the data through IP addresses and that sort of thing, um, you can make sure that the data is going to stay online. Um, and we want to use graduated, graduated sanctions for this, so we might have like a score for how healthy the data is. So for example, if one of them continuously keeps going offline, we might start marking this university as less stable, for example, or something like that. And we also want to provide means for dispute resolution. I don't really want to talk about that. Um, we build responsibility of governing the commons resource in a nested tiers from lowest level up to the entire connected system. So that means we involve everyone. So something that we've been building for this case is DAT. Um, by involving everyone, we mean that anyone should have the permission to download the data and um, re-upload it. So in this case, users own the data. Um, it's very secure. Um, so unlike BitTorrent, um, people can't just sniff your network and see what you're reading. Um, files can also be updated over time. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. How do we keep content addressability but also update the files? Um, files can be updated, which is really important in science because often there are retractions or problems, and you have to go back and like edit some part of it. So we keep it up to date, and you can also see back in time like when the scientific article was um, used, what kind of data they used. So it's really simple. You just it's a command line tool, and we also have a desktop app. Um, you just type dat share and the path to your data, and it creates a link. This is actually a public key that references your data on the network. And you can give this public key to someone else, and they just clone it, and then they get access to the data. They're connected to other people in the network through DHT, which is we're actually using the um, BitTorrent, the same one that BitTorrent uses. Um, DNS, we also have a DNS server that can connect people, or you can connect to people over LAN. Um, and it just connects the computers together um, and figures that out. It's using a, um, uh, a special kind of key, though. So we're not using, to keep things secure, we're not using this key. Um, we're actually computing something called a discovery key, which is the hash of this key. So only peers with the original link can compute this discovery key and find each other on the network. So this means that universities can even share private data between them, or people can share private data between you. And data that isn't yet available to the public won't be visible. So it means that people sniffing in the network don't know what you're sharing and downloading, unlike BitTorrent. So this link never changes, even as files are updated. And you can verify the hashes of the file system at specific versions and go back in time. This is really good for what I was talking about before, which is one in five articles suffers from reference rot, which is in insane, right? Like, out of one in five articles in science that are supposed to last forever, you can't get the original data that they were looking at or a link that they were linking to. So how are we doing this? I'm going to start getting a little technical. So prepare yourself. Um, we're using append-only logs. It's a list that um, only ever gets appended to. Um, so you append items to the list. And so why are we using append-only logs? It's in a simple data structure. It's immutable. There's some sort of logical ordering to it. And it's really easy to digest an index. If you go on to our GitHub and start looking, poking around at the code, you'll notice it's pretty easy to get started building your own application. How can we share append-only logs, though, over a peer-to-peer -peer network where we don't necessarily trust people? So People with laptops could be downloading this data and like re-hosting it on the network. We have to make sure that um, this data is secure and that people aren't tampering with it. So we use Merkle trees, which is a tree that verifies data. And it's unrelated to Angela Merkel, just, just to make sure that's clear. <laughs> um, so when you add data to DAT, you get this hash. Um, and it starts computing a tree where each root hash can verify all the hashes underneath of it and then the data below. 
So as these trees get built up, it's really nice um, as you can verify all the data. So if Alice wants to share a certain piece of data with Bob, we wanted to make sure that this was really easy to do. If I have a 300 terabyte um, scientific data journal thing, I don't want to have to share 300 terabytes with you. right? I might just want to share one little piece, maybe one a file or a half a file. Um, and this is a really important part of this. Um, so. Alice only, to do this, Alice only needs to share these intermediate hashes, not all the data and not all the hashes. And Bob can recreate the tree from those hashes and verify that she has the right root hash. So this is only, this is only log n time, which is pretty nice. But how do we do this in real time? So Dat can update data over time and maintains history. This is for static data, what I just showed you. When we start changing data, every time we append data, the root hash changes. So in BitTorrent, every time you append data or change the data, you have to create a whole entirely new torrent network. right? We don't really want to do that. So what we're trying to do is maintain the peers that we've always had. So crypto to the rescue. We generate a key pair. So as long as Bob trusts the public key, which is the link, but um, we can, as people add data to the structure, they sign it with their secret key, which verifies that the data has been added by the right person. So as they're checking the root hash signatures, they just have to use the public key that they were given to verify those signatures. Um, right now, DAT is only uh, one writer, but there's a new, um, library called HyperDB, which I'll show you a link to and I'll tweet it later, um, that has multiple writers and it's pretty experimental. Um, but you can start today with one writer. So how do we turn append-only logs into a file sharing tool? Because that's what we're really talking about. Scientific data is files. Websites are just files. Most of what we do is just files. So if we take a file and we cut it into pieces, we just insert each piece into the log. It's pretty simple, right? The thing that's tricky about it is where do you slice? So different kinds of binary files um, might want different kinds or might need different kinds of slices. We also insert the file name and file metadata in another log. So you can just grab the entire metadata of the data set and without even grabbing any of the content. This is unlike Git. Like Git forces you to download all the metadata and all the data at once because it stores the data in the tree. And we separate these, so it makes it a lot more efficient and uh, malleable. You can read more about our paper um, online or datproject.org. Just take a look. Um, one of the coolest use cases that we've done recently is work with, data, um, work with the California Digital Library to back up data from data.gov. So when all the data is deleted from the US government website, we will still have a copy available on DAT, so don't worry. <laughs> um, so when, when um, we downloaded this data, we saw that most of that data is actually, um, it's actually HTML. So if you look at the top right, most of this is like ordered by frequency. Most of the data is HTML. Um, it's not, it's not uh, like CSV files or zip files. So most of the data is actually just links to web pages that also link to the data. So we need a lot of help, right? <laughs> There's a lot of um, data on the web that might go offline tomorrow. Um, and we need to make sure that that data is available forever, right? So we've been starting to download this data and um, put it on our website. We have a registry where people can upload data, um, publish data under their name, like GitHub. Um, and so we have the California campaign finance data. We have um, the backup of open data released before it was deleted this year um, by President Trump. And then the names registry, which is uh, you know just a lot of cool data um, that we're trying to keep alive. Someone built, and this, his name's Richard, uh, Smith Una, he built a distributed science journal called Science Fair with DAT. So 
my use case around commons and science can also be applied to a lot of different applications. So this is just one application that was built with that, where you can search for a particular article and go and get that article from the decentralized web. So wouldn't it be really cool if people had a decentralized peer-to-peer um, -peer, uh, application where they could publish their data and publish their articles, scientific articles, um, without permission, and anyone could get can get those articles. You really actually have a hostless journal, which is really cheap to maintain. So this is kind of the dream of, of this app. There's also another app built on DAT called Beaker, which is a distributed web browser. It was built by Paul Frizzi. Um, and they, basically, it's just a fork of Chromium, where you can go to DAT colon slash slash your link, and then you can get uh, the website that's hosted there. You can even have a DNS record. Um, that points to the DAT URL, so people that go to the, the hostless dot website on their Chrome or Firefox can still see the website, but then you can, um, if they go to it in Beaker and use DAT colon, uh, use HTTP hostless website, it'll use the peer-to-peer -peer version. Um, so there's lots of other community-built um, uh, things here. So we have IngestDB, which is a peer-to-peer -peer database, so you can actually use SQL commands on top of a database yeah, that's peer-to-peer. Um, Beaker Browser, we talked about that. Fair Analytics is like a peer-to-peer -peer analytics server that's like um, Google, like a replacement for Google Analytics or one of these centralized services. So um, check out Fair Analytics. It's actually really cool and really modular. Um, this is OSM P2P DB, which is an open street map editor um, that's peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, as people edit, different people edit the, the, the map, you can see the history of the map and get it over peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, there's also DAT PKI, which is a public key infrastructure for DAT. Um, that's how you can um, create friends and contacts over DAT um, and publish a, a list of DATs and stuff like that. So you can take a look at what we've built um, on our GitHub. And Hyperdrive and HyperDB are the two underlying JavaScript modules that really manage a lot of um, the more complicated stuff, the Merkle DAGs and stuff that we're talking about here. Um, and if you wanted to play around with that in Node, please go ahead and build your own app. So let's take a step back, because um, I'm going to wrap up here in a minute. But maybe one of you is asking right now, so why aren't you using like blockchain or like Ethereum or like doing some ICO? And like, you know, why, why, why aren't you being all the, with all the cool kids? Um, so I have to take you back to the beginning of the web. Um, and what really inspires me and inspires us on our team. Some of the most fundamental people, this is on the left, this is um, Tim Berners-Lee. Um, he invented WWW. And then on the right, this guy is Vint Cerf, and he invented TCP IP. Um, they came from research labs. Um, and look, that's me. I'm at the Decentralized Web Conference, the Internet Archive. It was pretty fun. Um, <laughs> They gave away their protocols for free to the public, um, simply as products of scientific inquiry. There was no like profit motive. Their only judge was science, not profit. So with a commons approach to the decentralized web, the most ideal approach is guided from where we came. I'm excited about creating protocols that are easy to use and develop with and extend without asking for permission. I don't want to have to pay money if I don't have to. Um, and I believe that some of the best tools aren't created for the market at all. They're funded by donation, built for the public good, and given away for free. So these protocols that I want to build, should be I, I want to optimize for science and collaboration rather than optimizing for profit. So today we look at the decentralized landscape. This is a, the decentralized web conference last year. Um, so I look at the decentralized landscape in the context of what people were doing back in the day and wonder if we're continuing their legacy. Um, $1.6 billion, $1.6 billion were invested in ICOs, initial coin offerings, in 2016 alone. So this is like a huge growing uh, way to raise money and to, to build applications. I mean. Almost all of the money is going there, right? So why aren't we doing one of these? Why aren't we doing an ICO? 
If you really look at what they propose, many only offer siloed internets that are privatized, with money being invested into coins that may or may not even ever be available in production. So you're putting a lot of money into faith, into you know, a small team that has a lot of control over, over the coin and how it operates. Web of Commons is not blockchain. We're not, blockchains and bitcoins assume that I don't trust anyone in the network. And this is pretty much the opposite of what we're assuming with the Web of Commons. Everyone in the network is trusted, and those who aren't following the rules are kicked out. What we're trying to do with DAT is build tools for the common good um, that can also be used for other fun things um, and use sound technology. So decentralization, I believe, is not just a technological problem. It is also a human one. We have a lot of work to do. So if you want to donate, we're um, donate.datproject.org. We're a 501c3, so you can get a tax-deductible uh, donation if you want. Um, and don't forget to check out our stuff online and build something with debt. So thank you. Find me on Twitter. I'll be tweeting those links. I found that really interesting. Thank you. I also thought the live captioning on there was absolutely amazing. This is going to <laughs> New York and back um, and being live captioned by a person there in real time, which is pretty mind-blowing. Um, there were a few questions. Um, I think you answered one of them just, um, which was, uh, is that similar to uh, IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system? But I think you mm -hmm. just answered that one. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add on that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that is similar to IPFS in its construction and kind of, but it's different in its goals, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, a question by Isaac, which was, uh, I share your dreams, uh, but what if I want to be published in, say, one of Elsevier's journals um, where they make you grant all the rights to them? What happens then? Sorry. So uh, if you get published by Elsevier, they make you grant all of the rights to them. Could they still use, could you st they still use this? Um, mm. How does that limit it? So. Um, scientific researchers already have this um, little loophole when they give away their copyright, which is that they can um, publish their preprint, which is a slightly modified version mm -hmm. of the one that they do in copyright, and they can publish that preprint on like a university server or on their public website. So they could probably use their preprint, which probably only has like one word that's different. <laughs> right, and, okay, yeah. and that counts. Yeah. Um, Glenn asked, uh, how do you protect copyright files? Um, how do you make sure someone doesn't upload a Game of Thrones episode to this? I mean, you can use that for anything. I mean, that's, that's kind of uh, the great thing about it. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, the way we've built it is optimized for data sharing. Um, and we don't uh, condone or support <laughs> any illegal activities. Nice. Um, <laughs> And someone else, uh, James, asked, do public keys for trust relationships need to be shared over some other medium? Do you have a preferred way of that happening? Um, sharing links over preferred medium? Yeah. Um, right now we have a website um, that you can go to and log in and publish links with short links, short names. Um, so you can say, have an account like in GitHub and then create a, a short link for your data set. And people can also go and view that. So if you go to datproject.org, you can log in and publish a data set. Um, but you can also create um, a DNS record for it, like I was saying before. So you can, it's just an HTTP website um, that has a, a DAT-compatible link to it inside there. So um, either one, I think, is a good way. OK, um, great. But I mean, if you wanted to keep things really private and share data, you could also share the link over something like Signal or some encrypted channel. Um, which would mean that the link in the data that you share is entirely private. Okay, great. I think that's it. Thank yep. you very much. Thanks. Just a round of applause.